Incoming transmission. The Klingonese word of the day is dev. These are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise. So, this is a huge victory for the good guys. Scotty, beam me up. Resistance is futile. Live long and prosper. and welcome to the computer resume podcast the show covering the entire star trek franchise in chronological order and occasionally interviewing franchise alum for fans new and old i'm your host writer comedian mr todd a davis born in london raised in canada trained in shakespeare coaching the next generation of actors and starfleet admiral terrell in four episodes of star trek discovery it's conrad coates yay conrad (laughs) How's it going, man? <laughs> Very good, Todd. Such a pleasure to be here with you. Oh, man. I, I'm so excited when anyone is, yes, we'll sit with you, nerdy little boy, and talk about stuff. <laughs> talk about oh, stuff. Well, Absolutely. Do that. Yeah. Let's do it. <laughs> so, uh, you know what? I'm not going to beat around the bush. I'm going to get right into it. You were bo- born in London, moved uh, at an early age to Canada. My first question, why are Canadians so nice? What are you trying to hide? Is it? We, is we it a- we, nobody want. Nobody wants to come up here and take our snow. So we gotta like you know get you up here another way. So it's uh it's just part of the it's part of the culture. It's you know you know our sorry 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 for everything. Sorry sorry about sorry. That. Sorry. <laughs> so sorry sorry you stepped on my foot. I'm sorry you stepped on my foot. <laughs> you know the the I. I every Canadian Trek fan that I've ever encountered, they've always been super nice and so and so helpful and just everything so yeah you guys are you guys are batting a thousand amen thank you i'll spread the word uh so you know uh trek long island's coming up so we're we're gearing up with a bunch of interviews with uh with some of the actors and uh you know they talk about getting into star trek like not everybody gets in the club this is a it's a pretty tricky club to get into, uh, especially when it comes down to the auditioning process. And a lot of actors have said, you know, their auditioning process was difficult, easy, but di- either way, it's definitely memorable. What was your experience getting the role for Star Trek Discovery? Wow. So first season, uh, very secretive, very, you know, hush, hush. Uh, the show is shot in uh, Toronto in a local studio there. Yeah, and um, I would get the sides. They were called something else. That was never any indication that you were actually auditioning for a character in the Star Trek realm. So mm-hmm. you know, you get some crazy speech. Uh, <laughs> I think I auditioned like four or five times, and so every time it was uh, a speech, it was a scene that has nothing to do with Star Trek. Just. <laughs> dialogue and i think that they were really trying to check you know acting skills and that's that's fair so i think what the the piece that i did was yeah like something to do with military mm, but, mm-hmm. and not not hinting uh, um towards the star trek world at all wow typically you know on those early sides they they even give the characters a different name do you remember oh, what yeah. do you remember what the character you were reading for do you remember that original name it might have been soldier. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, you know yeah. I mean, it's like that that secretive. Um, Jeez. So again, like you have no idea what you're doing for, and I think they're really just trying to see your interpretive skills of what it is that they want you to do. Yeah, and it yeah. seems like something like that would be very very revealing, you know, especially if you've got higher trained level actors. I think it gets rid of your preconceived notions of what might be in your hand in front of your face. And it's just like, all right, let's see how you react and look on camera. Amen. That would be right. So along with that, talking about using those skills, a lot of actors have said that having Shakespeare in their background was a big, big plus. We talked with uh, Elizabeth Dennehy from Next Generation uh, sometime last year. And she's huge on Shakespeare and really saying the praises of being able to 
spit out this Shakespearean dialogue. And then when it comes to techno babble in a Star Trek script, they're actually very similar. You've got some Shakespearean training in your background. First of all, if you wouldn't mind telling us a little bit about it. And then did you see yourself applying any of the Shakespeare training in your time on Star Trek Discovery? Wow, that's a, that's a serious question. <laughs> I was really fortunate in my early days of learning acting. I worked in a local theater company in Toronto, Tarragon Theater. Uh, there's a grand dame of the stage in Canada, Martha Henry. And my first apprentice show was with her. First time I was on stage publicly uh, was in this Toronto production. And Martha Henry, she was the grand dam of the stage at the Stratford Festival, where Justin Bieber is from. She said to me, like very early in uh, in the run, you know, if you if you're gonna be a serious actor, like you gotta you have to do Shakespeare. And uh, I I took everything that Martha said to heart, and I then spent the next ten years pursuing all plays Shakespeare, writing to theater companies and artistic directors. If they didn't have a black character in their season or in the show, would they consider, you know, casting non-traditionally? And a couple of theaters took me up on that offer. So I, I got my break onto the stage doing Shakespeare, Romeo and Juliet, and Twelfth Night uh, were some of the early ones that I did. And then uh, I was in another show uh, that was a hit, fortunately, and everybody came and saw it because we extended the run of the artistic director for the festival. He came and saw the show and just raved about my performance in there. And that's when I got a chance to go to the festival. So I was in the Young Company the first year and on the main stage in the second year. And how I can say it helps is I find that the language between Shakespeare and the scientific gobbledygook is I find learning the science speak much harder mm -hmm. because there's nothing really in the existence of reality where these things exist. Exactly. In the Bard's world, you know, it's all about nature. It's about love. All of his plays are about love primarily. And so, you know, those images are easier to hold on to. But the rhythm of speaking, the communicating skill, the crossing of ideas, that is done through language. And that helps. Mm. That I had the discipline to do. But for learning about the galaxies and all the different technologies that used in that Star Trek has used over the years, yeah. that's tricky. You know, I was I, I didn't want to blow my opportunity when I when I knew I was cast. I I really wanted to be prepared. So as a quick aside, um, working with uh, Jason Isaac in the first scene that I was going to shoot, we rehearsed a scene with the camera and the writer. Zach producer comes over and he goes, oh, man, that's terrible. I'm just going to rewrite this. And I had already spent two weeks, like, you know, <laughs> learning these pages. And he said that to me. And I immediately started to panic. But I wasn't showing that I was panicking. But I, I, inside, I was terrified because I thought, OK, I'm on point. I'm good to go. And then he goes off in the corner and rewrites two pages and goes, here you go. OK, let's shoot this. And I literally had 30 seconds to learn the speech. And I don't know how I did it, but I just, I think the first thing I said to myself was, don't complain, just do it. That was the first thing I said to myself. And I just found a corner of the set. And I don't think I have a photographic memory, but I read that thing so many times so quickly and it somehow went in there and we shot it. And then I hear this scream from behind the camera and Video village. Yeah, genius. That was wonderful. That was great. <laughs> that is awesome. But I was terrified, I have to tell you, terrified. Oh, yeah. I, I can't, I, you know, because I mean, I set it up at the top, and hell, I've said it pretty much on every episode of this podcast. There's no slouches on Star Trek, like everybody, yeah. especially nowadays, where including expanding the intelligent in front of the camera they're also expanding the talent behind the camera as well and when you've got regular nasa consultants on set like who have been who this is their retirement gig and that's got to be a, in the heads of some astrophysicists you know it's like well when i retire from here i'll go get my job at star trek and <laughs> 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 but yeah it, i mean Oh gosh, yeah, that that's uh, congratulations on sticking the landing on that speech. Cause thank like, you. Yes, that was a 10. Yes. Looking back, it was just like 
did they find an actual Vulcan? This dude is awesome. <laughs> he just no, they nailed were, that. They were thrilled. They were thrilled. So, uh, you know, having, ha- I mean, not basically, basi- I mean, you quite literally had the rug ripped out from under you. Um, uh, was that the most challenging part of playing Admiral Tyrrell? Because, I mean, you've got some makeup to go through. The uniform, I've heard, cannot be super comfortable. Like, what was the most challenging part of Admiral Terrell? Well, being a Vulcan is such an iconic species. It's not even a character. It's a species, right? And, right. of course, Leonard Nimoy put the bar right there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and I, I mean, I can't remember the gentleman's name uh, who played the young Spock. Uh, in the film, but he too also really put his stamp on, you know, how a Vulcan should behave, particularly if he's playing the younger Spock. Like, so he's he's already in the footprint. That that seems to be the uh, that seems to be an issue when they talk with these younger guys who are now playing these es- established iconic roles, and when it comes to Spock, Zachary Quinto, who did it for J.J. Abrams, and then you've got Ethan Peck, who's doing it now over on Strange New Worlds. Wow, they they are knocking it out of the park. Yeah, they are. And exploring new territory. So, exactly. Sorry to cut you. Sorry to cut you off. No, 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 no. It's a, it's a valid point because you know that's in my mind, yes. and so there's a parameter and a framework that you have to work within. And the biggest part of it is the no emotion, yes. right? It's all logic and intellect. And I'm a human being, and I have emotion, and I'm in a situation where I think I would be emotional, and the note constantly let's do that line again conrad and just push all the emotion down that was the hardest part especially when we're talking about destruction and what's to come and is there going to be a war and you still have to maintain this very zero decibel level of emotion there's there's nothing is supposed to be you know coming out and so for me that was the trickiest part i mean being still that's that's part of acting on camera, you're standing on a mark, you're not really waving around in the breeze, that's great. But to be able to like deliver and be thinking and still not be emotionally attached to it, that was a bit of a trick. Yeah, I, I got to imagine, because even, I mean, one thing I've noticed in looking at the different cinematography techniques from, of course, the original series and into the legacy generation and now with New Trek, the camera has gotten closer and closer to the face. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm there's no there's nowhere to hide like no, even as a vulcan if you open your eyes too much cut we gotta start again exactly That's like exactly correct it's in every fiber of their being and you know training to get it seems like and correct me if i'm wrong but a lot of acting training is to bring out the emotion so this go this is counterbalance to everything you've learned 100 percent. yeah and like talking about being painted into a corner like Actors want these roles, but if you've got you it, and it's such a weird balance because you could be, Oh, I can just stand there. Well, it's not just standing there. It's like, well, you're not supposed to emote. Yes. But all of that is on the inside. (laughs) Yeah. You have to stay alive. Exactly. You got to be breathing. You still have to be, you know, communicating, which is a communion, you know, it's a reciprocal thing. Like you give me information, I take that in, I'm responding accordingly. So there's no just like, let me just go into a silo and I will just say my words and that will be it. There's there's none of that going on, right? So yeah, got to stay alive. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, you know, you uh, have made a memorable impression on the Star Trek community. Thank you for doing uh, Admiral Terrell uh, so well. Thank uh, you. It's it's now it's going to be uh, another fun thing to spot uh, upon rewatches and uh, gosh I'm sure a lot of people are still rewatching you know with uh, Discovery ending uh, this season but uh, yes. so speaking of the fan community I imagine these ravenous passionate science fiction fans create an interesting part of this weird actor life and so I imagine with the Star Trek family it's not any different have you had any memorable fan interactions at another convention one of the first ones that i went to you know there's other realness that's going on right and so i was a little terrified quite frankly uh, Uh in thinking that i'm not good enough to be part of this uh universe 
of mania. Um, it's not not my thing. It's not I, I don't work to be famous. I barely even work for the money. I do it because I love it. Yeah. I love the profession. I love the business. I love telling stories. But when I got there, what became really apparent to me, like the evening of the first, like a Friday evening, we were all kind of meeting each other, was really how the ideas of what it can be about, I found that to be so hype. And when I actually met the people, I couldn't have met nicer, grounded, down to earth, happy to meet you. Let's not play on that. They are happy to meet me. But I also found that it was I was reciprocating that I was really happy to meet them because I kept on waiting for the crazy to come out. And there was no crazy. It was just people who were passionate about the philosophy of what Star Trek universe is all about. And that was a real eye opener to me. You want to talk about, you know, somebody trying to be not emotional. That made me very emotional. Wow. It, it was such a, a, a genuine affection for Roddenberry, as clearly his family and his children now who are continuing this legacy. But there is a message in there, in mm. all of these products that are so needed today. Can we talk about a little world peace, everybody? Preach. That's <laughs> the thing that really blew me away about being at these conventions. These people really want a better world. You know, the con experience is a thing that has been joked about on Family Guy. And, you know, there's the stereotypical stuff that you see through like Big Bang Theory. But I have a con memory of walking in and the places are they do these things in. They're huge. A uh, little ways in front of me, I could see that there was a child without a without a grown up. <laughs> and the child was looking around and realized my grown up is gone and shortly after there were some some folks in cosplay these big huge suits that look screen accurate and she stopped them and was like I can't find I can't find my parents and so one of the cosplayers scooped up the child like held held them up <laughs> like do you see them <laughs> it's like well we'll we'll stand here and protect you until until your parents get oh, back oh wicked yeah yeah but like so few places where you can do stuff like that in the world and and you know people who are there excited to be connected in any way to a franchise and I'll speak specifically about Star Trek but it's not a secret Star Trek is based on hope and there's so few science fiction franchises that really emphasize hope I was joking around with some of my friends talking about the different positions and different officers on the ship and everything. And I left out science officer. And they're like, you can't leave out science officer. I said, they're all science officers. Right. <laughs> all these people are ex extremely smart, very capable. Um, yeah. They are at the top of their game. Like this is, we are supposed to work our way towards that. You know, we're supposed to be communicating better and having better dip diplomacy with people we don't know or don't understand and oh okay we only have so much time i, I can't get on a soapbox for too oh, long yeah, you no know, you're riding the way the right wave with that thought though that's that's exactly it you know i mean you know, just mentioned how you know retired nasa people want to be a part of this universe so i think that that really says something like there is a different level of professional acumen and skill that's required and yes everybody on a starship in the fleet has to have all of those skills not just you know i know how to send a text like it goes beyond that clearly right yeah and, and look I've, I've said it before i you know one of the goals when i started this show was to examine the question which is how do we get from here to yeah. gene roddenberry's vision of the future yeah yeah and through over Oh, we're over 120 episodes at this point, for sure. I've said many times, if we're going to reach the stars, we have to reach sideways first because mm -hmm. nobody, nobody gets there alone. So if you don't know what they're saying, learn the language. If, if, if they've got a better idea than you, that's great. That's the best idea we should go with. Exactly. <laughs> like, exactly. Let's put all that other stuff aside. Anyways. Okay. So <laughs> Conrad, we're almost out of time, but would you like to do a lightning round? Oh, Todd, please. 
<laughs> I was hoping you'd ask me. <laughs> I am so good at lightning rounds. You're making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Is the jelly grape or strawberry? Strawberry. That is correct. <laughs> what is your favorite play by the Bard? Titus Andronicus. Really? Why? Yeah, it's okay. So it's a very early work. I think the language is a little bit more accessible in terms of its the meter of it, the the comprehension of the story, so forth. And more importantly, there's this character in there, this black character in there called Aaron, and he's so evil. And when he is on trial, they catch him at the end for all this murder and mayhem that he did. And they mm. ask him, do you have anything to say before we kill you? And he goes, yeah, I wish I'd kill more people. And I, and I thought that was like, this guy's so interesting. And it's Shakespeare's Rambo play. Oh, wow. The body count in Titus Andronicus is up in the hundreds, hundreds and hundreds. You know, it all happens off stage, which is really interesting. So you, you know, you have these characters coming in basically, yeah, I took out 50 in one swing because we got swords, not bullets and things. But but yeah, <laughs> I just I just find it to be like it's almost like a cartoon. And like I say, I think the best reference in it is like a Rambo. That's awesome. Yeah. That's so yeah. great. Who's the funniest person you know? Okay, so it's gotta be my friend Jody. Jody is a you know actor turned musician, but this guy has about a thousand characters living inside of him all the time so you really never quite know who you're talking to he's not insane but we should have him committed uh, and uh, to, to really make this cake so beautiful he is the sweetest guy in the world like the sweetest guy in the world. I, I, I love Jody to death and then uh, professionally if we have anybody wants to go and look somebody up uh Stephen Wright the comic Stephen Wright is like yes. oh my god that's genius what he does it's genius first of all thank you for bringing up <laughs> him it's uh you know stephen wright is such a he's on he, he's almost gotten lost in the in the world in the smoky hazy world that stand-up comedy is nowadays mm -hmm. but he still has one of my favorite one-liners and i can edit this out or whatever but he goes tried to hang myself with a bungee cord <laughs> That's funny. i kept almost dying <laughs> that kills me it kills yes. me. some of those some of those simple ideas are the things that get me the most like a really Absolutely. really well crafted one-liner oh so good yeah um I will share my, I will, sh that now, unfortunately, as good as that one is, my favorite, and then we'll move on. Okay. Um, favorite one-liner, BJ Novak, uh, back on, back when Seth Meyers was still hosting, or no, back when um, Conan O'Brien was still hosting Late Night. Okay. BJ Novak came out and said, battered women. Sounds delicious. Doesn't make it right. <laughs> <laughs> That, that went three ways for me. I was like, oh, we're going up in there. Oh, we're up. That's, oh, okay. That was, that's, I see why that's your gold ribbon winner right there. Yeah, it's, okay. yeah, okay. just too much. Just too much. Um, so we would have also accepted uh, the host of the Computer Resume podcast, Mr. Todd A. Davis. That's fine. Oh, I know him. I yeah, know him. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, listen, uh, consistently no one has taken that option when I've interviewed them, and that's fine. That just makes me want to strive to be funnier, honestly. Gotta work harder. Gotta work harder, Todd. Come on, buddy. Come on. You recently appeared in seven episodes of FX's Fargo. Yeah. Juno Temple is listed as five foot two. True or false? True. You know, it is true, but she feels like she should be smaller, doesn't she? You know, if I could put her in my pocket, I would. I'd still get, I'd get a lining, a special lining, and I'd still, I'd have her right there with me. Uh, I, I, have a, I have a photo up on my Instagram, and um, I've gotten so much response from the photo. It's just the two of us together. We were kind of clowning around. Yeah. And uh, special lady, man. Great talent. Really hard worker. Uh, and such a treat to be with. Not just acting in a scene with, but just to be with. Yeah. Such a beautiful soul. Amen.
she she gives off a real she gives off a real like best friend quick kind of vibe. One hundred percent. Yeah, uh, what we caught her. The wife and I watched um, the story about the making of the Godfather uh, that was on Paramount Plus last year, and she has a role in that. And it was just kind of like, oh, there she is. I always imagined like I was imagining her traveling around like the Tasmanian Devil, just. And then they're like, "Okay, we're get ready to shoot," and that's when she'll slow down. <laughs> right? Yeah, she's she's going like the first time I met her. So she was in character, and we're sitting in the same vehicle. And I get in; she's already in the vehicle. And I get in; I'm sitting beside her, and she was just blah, 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 and this crazy North Dakota, Minnesota accent. And you know, when seeing her from Ted Lasso. To Fargo, I think that's a triple crossing universe right there. Oh, and, yeah. Um, I just turned to her and I went, Excuse me, but who are you? What are you playing in this show? And she was on Gino Temple. And I was like, Oh my God, stop the car. I've got to kiss this lady's feet. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but, but but from that moment, I felt we became friends. So I'm, I'm embarrassed to tell that story, but at the same time, happy at the end. Oh, that's awesome. What did you steal from the set? Of Star Trek Discovery. Uh, <clears throat> uh, nothing. <laughs> anything, anything, anything from the show. <laughs> want everybody to know that, that I didn't take anything from the show. But <laughs> I did go through the garbage uh, <laughs> one day after one of my episodes, and I, only because they were in the garbage, they were going in the garbage through a bigger garbage bin outside of the makeup truck, just saying, and, uh, I took my ears. Nice. I took my pointy ears. I have them in a, a silver box, like a real silver velvet box that I nice. only take it, and I only show my children and I put it back away and I put it in a special drawer that nobody knows where to go to when they break into my house now. But uh, Wonderful. I, I had to, I had to, to tell you the truth, I just, I just had to. It's so iconic. How can you not? 100%. And they're tailor made for you. It's not like they're, they're mine. I yeah. wore them. Yeah. Well, they're not mine. But technically, <laughs> they're not mine. Technically, <laughs> but uh, they were in the garbage. Let me say that again. Do you think I could beat Spike Lee at basketball? Todd, so I've I've met Spike. Um, I could beat him in basketball. You could give him a good run for the money. <laughs> First of all, that's incredibly kind. You have no idea how bad I am at basketball. <laughs> yeah, well, I just I know that I've I've seen Spike on the sideline. I think he knows the game quite well. But you you'd have to give him you you might give him a good run for his money. Okay, all right, yeah. all right. Yeah. It, it, I, yeah. Listen, if I could just keep up with the man, <laughs> I would that's consider enough. that a win. <laughs> there you go. You're right. You've played policeman number two, DA number two, fielding rep number one, preacher number two, frog hammer employee number one, doctor number one, and dinner guest number one. Question, do you ever feel bad for skipping the other numbers? I think one and two cover it all. Like we don't, we don't know what you don't need to go to cop seven and detective three and door boy number four. And like, why? Like if you're not number one, what are you? You're 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 nothing in that show if you're if you're a number four, really. You're probably not even in focus if you've got a number four number. But yeah, if you're not the lead dog, the scenery never changes, right? Exactly right. That's exactly <laughs> right. Put that tree right over there. I'll be right there. <laughs> what is the name of your character in season one, episode twenty of the '90s vampire series, Forever Night? <laughs> Oh my God, Todd! First of all, very, Conrad, very you you good. need this, or you're going to lose the game. Okay, yeah, I have a <laughs> feeling I'm going to lose the game. So uh, I remember the scene too. It was so quick, so quick, and, and then it was like, okay, and that's a picture wrap for Conrad playing detective. Oh, nope, not not coming. To Conrad, me. I'm gonna I'm gonna need a name. There's there's, there's there is no name. I'm so sorry, Conrad. Oh. But that is the right answer. Nobody yeah, knows. Yeah. <laughs> and the crowd goes wild. <laughs>
And that's how you do a lightning round, folks. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. Thank you, so, Todd. Uh, Conrad, before we get going, uh, you're going to be at Trek Long Island this summer, correct? Let's uh, let's give them uh, let's give them the details. I'm going to be there. I'll be appearing from May 31st to June 2nd. There will be photo opportunities for everybody, and it'd be great to meet some people, new new fans, new friends, and new fans and faces. Saturday at five on the main stage, I'll be on a panel with a few other admirals, and we're going to talk about our careers, our Star Trek experiences, et cetera. Probably take questions from the audience. And uh, there's going to be a panel, Todd, actually, oddly enough, with you, yes, Daddy Davis, from this fabulous podcast. Thank you so much. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, uh, I, I I know. Yeah, I know that. Uh, I know that Todd A. Davis. I, I heard yeah, he. I heard he hosts a mean panel. <laughs> he does. I hope he does. Yes. <laughs> uh, yes, folks. Trek Long Island 2024 at the Hyatt Regency, Long Island, May 31st through June 2nd. They are going to be stuffed to the rafters with authors, artists, uh, industry professionals. Not to mention. Trek stars from all over the franchise, including Discovery, Strange New Worlds, Next Gen, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, Lower Decks, Prodigy, and Picard. May 31st through June 2nd. For more information and to get your tickets, go to treklongisland.com. Next time, we will be back to our regularly scheduled programming. But in the meantime, Conrad, where can people find information about stuff that you're working on and look you up and support what you've got going on uh okay so i'm a big instagram fan so it's at conrad coats and i do also i teach as well um, in toronto i teach at the york university campus of seneca college uh, i teach acting up there um, we also have a coaching company studio or myself and a couple other guest instructors you can check that out online at coats and company dot com um, for classes acting classes do some stuff online not too often but if people are interested sure send me a message and i am at mr todd a davis on all of the socials from all of us at the computer resume podcast thank you so much for listening and i'll see you in 10 forward Like, rate, review, and share on all your favorite platforms. Feel free to send us your subspace transmissions to Computer Resume Podcasts at gmail.com or at Computer Resume on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. The Computer Resume Podcast was created and produced by Mr. Todd A. Davis. Our logo was designed by Will Martin and Justin Bishop. The opening theme was produced by Justin Bishop, and our outro music was provided with permission by Dronode. Additional music was provided by Mr. Todd A. Davis and Gary Horn, and the voice of Computer Resume Podcast and executive producer, me, Kat Davis. Hashtag LLAP. We'll see you next time. Going through a Star Trek. <laughs> We're doing Star Trek stuff in space. <laughs> We probably got some phasers and shuttle pods, and we're gonna find a brand new race. How's that for a slice of fried gold?